Chapter 58. Steering northeastward from the Crozettes, we fell in with the vast meadows of Brit, the minute yellow substance upon the, which the right whale largely feeds. For leagues and leagues it undulated round us, so that we seemed to be sailing through boundless fields of ripe and golden wheat. On the second day, numbers of right whales were seen, who, secure from the attack of a sperm whaler like the Pequod, with open jaws sluggishly swam through the Brit, which adhering to the fringing fibers of that wondrous Phoenician blind in their mouths, was in that manner separated from the water that escaped at the lip. As morning mowers who side by side slowly and seethingly advanced their sighs through the long wet grass of marshy meads, even so these monsters swam, making a strange grassy cutting sound and leaving behind them endless swaths of the blue upon the yellow sea. That part of the sea known among whalemen as the Brazil Banks does not bear the name as the banks of Newfoundland do, because of there being shallows and soundings there, but because of this remarkable meadow-like appearance caused by the vast drifts of Brit continually floating in those latitudes where the right whale is often chased. But it was only the sound they made as they parted the Brit, which had all reminded one of mowers. Seen from the mastheads, especially when they paused and were stationary for a while, their vast black forms looked more like lifeless masses of rock than anything else. And as in the great hunting countries of India, the stranger at a distance will sometimes pass on the plains recumbent elephants without knowing them to be such, taking them for bare blackened elevations of the soil. Even so, often with him, who for the first time beholds this species of leviathans at the sea. And even when recognized at last, their immense magnitude renders it very hard really to believe that such bulky masses of overgrowth can possibly be instinct in all parts with the same sort of life that lives in a dog or a horse. Indeed, in other respects, you can hardly regard any creature of the deep with the same feeling that you do of those of the shore. For though some old naturalists have maintained that all creatures of the land are of their kind in the sea, and though taking a broad general view of the thing, this may very well be. Yet coming to specialities, where, for example, does the ocean furnish any fish that in disposition answers to the sagaciousness kindness of the dog? The accursed shark alone can be, in any generic respect, be said to bear comparative analogy to him. But though to landsmen in general, the native inhabitants of the seas have ever been regarded with emotions unspeakingly unsocial and repelling. Though we know the sea to be an everlasting terra incognita, so that Columbus sailed over numerous unknown worlds to discover his one superficial western one. Though by vast odds, the most terrific of all mortal disasters have immemorially and indiscriminately befallen tens and hundreds of thousands of those who have gone upon the waters though but a moment's consideration will teach. And however baby man may brag of his science and skill, and however much in a flattering future that science and skill may augment, yet forever and ever to the crack of doom, the sea will insult and murder him and pulverize the stateliest, stiffest frigate he can ever make. Nevertheless, by the continual repetition of these very impressions, man has lost that sense of the full awfulness of the sea, which aboriginally belongs to it. The first boat we read of floated on an ocean, that which that with Portuguese vengeance had overwhelmed the whole world without leaving much as a widow. That same ocean rolls now. That same ocean destroyed the wrecked ships of last year. Yea, foolish mortals, Noah's flood is not yet subsided. Two thirds of the fair world it yet covers. Wherein differ the sea and the land, that a miracle upon one is not a miracle upon the other? Preternatural terrors rested upon the Hebrews, when under the feet of Korah and his company, the live ground opened and swallowed them up forever. Yet not a modern sun ever sets, but in precisely the same manner, the live sea swallows up ships and crews. But not only is the sea such a foe to man, who is an alien to it, but is also a fiend to its own offspring worse than the Persian host who murdered his own guests, 
sparing not the creatures which itself hath spawned, like a savage tigress that tossing in the jungle overlays her own cubs. So the sea dashes even the mightiest whales against the rocks and leaves them there side by side with the split wrecks of ships. No mercy, no power but its own controls it. Panting and snorting like a mad battle steed that has lost its rider, the masterless ocean overruns the globe. Consider the subtleness of the sea. How his most dreaded creatures glide underwater unapparent for the most part and treacherously hidden beneath the loveliest tints of azure. Consider also the devilish brilliance and beauty of many of its most remorseless drives as the dainty embellished shape of many species of sharks. Consider once more the universal cannibalism of the sea, all whose creatures prey upon each other, carrying on eternal war since the world began. Consider all of this, and then turn to this green, gentle, and most docile earth. Consider them both, the sea and the land. And do you not find a strange analogy to something in yourself? For as this appalling ocean surrounds the verdant land, so in the soul of man there lies one insular Tahiti, full of peace and joy, but encompassed by all the horrors of the half-known life. God keep thee, push not off from that isle, thou canst never return. Chapter 59, Moby Dick. Slowly wading through the meadows of Brits, the peacock still held on her way northeastward towards the island of Java. A gentle air impelling her keel, so that in the surrounding serenity, her three tall tapering masts mildly waved to that languid breeze as three mild palms on the plain, and still at wide intervals in the silvery night, the lonely alluring jet would be seen. But one transparent blue morning, when the stillness almost <coughs> preternatural spread over the sea, however unattended with any stagnant calm, when the long burnished sun glade on the waters, seeing the golden finger laid across them, enjoying some secrecy. When the slippered waves whispered together as they softly ran on, in the pound hush of the visible sphere, a strange spectre was seen by Daggy from the main masthead. In the distance, a great white mast lazily rose, rising higher and higher, and disentangling itself from the azure, at last gleam before our prow like a snow slide, new slid from the hills. Thus glistening for a moment, it slowly subsided and sank. Then once more arose and silently gleamed, it seemed not aware. And yet is this Moby Dick, thought then. Again the phantom went down, but on reappearing once more, with a stiletto-like cry that startled every man from his knob, the negro yelled out, there, there again. There she breaches right ahead, the white whale, the white whale. Upon this, the seamen rushed to the yard arms, as in swarming times the bees rushed to the bows. Bareheaded in the sultry sun, Ahab stood on the bowsprit, and with one hand pushed far behind in readiness to wave his orders to the helmsman, cast his eager glide in the direction indicated aloft by the outstretched motionless arm of Daniel. Whether the flitting attendance of one still and solitary jet had gradually worked upon Ahab, so that he was now prepared to connect the idea of mildness and repose with the first sight of the particular way of the pursuit. However, this was, or was the degree of eagerness betrayed him, whichever way it might have been, no sooner did he distinctly perceive the white mass, than with a quick intensity he instantly gave orders for a loan. Four boats were soon on the water, Ahab's in advance, and all swiftly pulling towards their prey. Soon it went down, and while we were all suspended, we were waiting its reappearance. Lo, in the same spot where it sank, once more it slowly rose. Almost forgetting for the moment all thoughts of Moby Dick, we now gaze at the most wondering phenomenon which the secret seas have hitherto revealed to mankind. A vast, pulpy mass, furlongs in length and breadth of a glassy cream colour lay floating on the water, innumerable long arms radiating from its centre, and curling and twisting like a nest of anacondas, 
as if blindly to collapse at any hapless object within reach. No perceptible face or front did it have, no conceivable token of either sensation or instinct, but undulated there on the billows an unearthly, formless, chance like apparition of light, as with a low sucking sound it slowly disappeared again. Starbuck, still gazing at the agitated water where it had sunk, with a wild voice exclaimed, Almost rather had I seen Moby Dick and fought him than to have seen thou, thou white ghost. What was it, sir? said Class. A great live squid, which they say few whale ships ever beheld and returned to their ports to tell of it. But they have said nothing. Turning his boat, he sailed back to the vessel, the rest of silent before him. Whatever superstitions the sperm whalemen in general have connected with the sight of this object, certain it is that a glimpse of it being so very unusual that circumstances have gone far to invest it with portentousness. So rarely is it beheld that though one and all of them declare it to be the largest animated thing in the ocean, yet very few of them have any but the most vague ideas concerning its true nature and form. Notwithstanding, they believe it to furnish to the sperm whale his only food. For though other species of whales find their food above water, and may be seen by man in the act of feeding, the spermaceti whale obtains his whole food in unknown zones below the surface. And only by inference is it that anyone can tell of what precisely that food consists. At times when closely pursued, he will disgorge what are supposed to be the detached arms of the squid. Some of them thus exhibited exceeding 20 and 30 feet in length. They fancy that the same monster to which these arms belong ordinarily clings by them to the bed of the ocean, and that the sperm whale, and like other species, is supplied with teeth in order to attack and tear it. There seems some ground to imagine that the great kraken of Bishop Pontopolden may ultimately resolve itself into squid. The manner in which the bishop describes it as alternatively rising and sinking, with some other particulars he narrates, in all this the two correspond. But much abatement is necessary with, with respect to the incredible bulk he assigned it. By some naturalists who have vaguely heard rumours of this mysterious, mysterious creature here spoken of, it is included among the class of Cruttlefish, to which indeed in certain external respects it was seen to belong, but only as the anarch of the tribe. Chapter 60. The Line With reference to the whaling scene shortly to be described, as well as for the better understanding of all similar scenes elsewhere presented, I have here to speak of the magical, sometimes horrible, whale line. The line, originally used in the fishery, was of the best hemp, slightly vapored with tar, not impregnated with it, as in the case of ordinary ropes. For while tar, as ordinarily used, makes the hemp more pliable to the rope maker, and also renders the rope itself more convenient to the sailor for common ship use, yet not only would the ordinary quantity too much stiffen the whale line for the close coiling to which it must be subjected, but as most seamen are beginning to learn, tar in general by no means adds to the rope's durability or strength. However, much it may give it compactness and gloss. Of late years, the manila rope has in the American fishery almost entirely superseded hemp as a material for whale lines, for, though not so durable as hemp, it is stronger, and far more soft and elastic, and I will add, since there is an aesthetics in all things, is much more handsome and becoming to the boat than hemp. Hemp is a dusky, dark fellow, a sort of Indian, but Manila is as a golden-haired Circassian to behold. The whale line is only two-thirds of an inch in thickness. At first sight, you would not think it so strong as it really is. By experiment, its one and fifty yarns will each suspend a weight of 120 pounds, so that the whole rope will bear a strain nearly equal to three tons. In length, the common sperm whale line measures something over 200 fathoms. 
towards the stern of the boat, it is spirally coiled away in the tub, not like the worm pipe of us still, though, but so as to form one round cheese-shaped mass of densely bedded sheaves or layers of concentric spiralizations without any hollow but the heart or minute vertical tube formed at the axis of the cheese. As the least tangle or kink in the coiling would, in running out, infallibly take somebody's arm, leg, or entire body off, the utmost precaution is used in stowing the line in its tub. Some harpooners will consume almost an entire morning in this business, carrying the line high aloft and then reeving it downwards through a block towards the tub, so as in the act of coiling to free it from all possible wrinkles and twists. In the English boats, two tubs are used instead of one, the same line being continuously coiled in both tubs. There is some advantage in this because these twin tubs, being so small that they fit more readily into the boat and do not strain it so much, whereas the American tub, nearly three feet in diameter and of proportionate depth, makes a rather bulky freight for a craft whose planks are but one half inch in thickness. For the bottom of the whaleboat is like critical ice, which will bear up a considerable distributed weight but not very much of a concentrated one. When the painted canvas cover is clapped on the American line tub, the boat looks as if it were pulling off with a prodigious great wedding cake to present to the whales. Both ends of the line are exposed, the lower end terminating in an eye splice or loop coming up from the bottom against the side of the tub and hanging over its edge completely disengaged from everything. This arrangement of the lower end is necessary on two accounts. First, in order to facilitate the fastening to it of an additional line from a neighboring boat in case the stricken whale should sound so deep as to threaten to carry off the entire line originally attached to the harpoon. In these instances, the whale of course is shifting like a mug of ale, as it were, from the one boat to the other though the first boat always hovers at hand to assist its consort. Second, this arrangement is, is indispensable for common safety's sake. For were the lower end of the line in any way attached to the boat, and were the whale then to run the line out to the end almost in a single smoking minute, as he sometimes does, he would not stop there, for the doomed boat would infallibly be dragged down after him into the profundity of the sea and in that case no town crier would ever find her again. Before lowering the boat for the chase, the upper end of the line is taken aft from the tub, and passing round the loggerhead there is again carried forward the entire length of the boat, resting crosswise upon the loom or handle of every man's oar, so that it jogs against his wrist in rowing, and also passing between the men, as they alternately sit at the opposite gunwales, to the leaded chocks or grooves in the extreme pointed prow of the boat, where a, wooded, where a wooden pin or skewer the size of a common quill prevents it from slipping out. From the chocks it hangs in a slight festoon over the bows, and is then passed inside the boat again, and some ten or twenty fathoms called box line being coiled upon the box in the bows, it continues its way to the gunwale still a little further aft and is then attached to the short warp, the rope which is immediately connected with the harpoon, but previous to that connection the short warp goes through sundry mystifications too tedious to detail. Thus the whale line folds the whole boat in its complicated coils, twisting and writhing around it in almost every direction. All the oarsmen are involved in its parallel perilous contortions, so that to the timid eye of the landsman they seem as Indian jugglers, with the deadliest snakes sportively festooning their limbs. Nor can any son of mortal woman, for the first time, seat himself amid those hempen intricacies, and while straining his utmost at the oar, bethink him that any unknown instant the harpoon may be darted, and all these 
horrible contortions be put in play like ringed lightnings. He cannot be thus circumstanced without a shudder that makes the very marrow in his bones to quiver in him like a shaken jelly. Yet habit, strange thing, what cannot habit accomplish? Gayer sallies, more merry mirth, better jokes, and brighter repartees you never heard over your mahogany than you will hear over the half-inch white cedar of the whaleboat. When thus hung in hangman's nooses, and like the six burghers of Calais before King Edward, the six men composing the crew pull into the jaws of death with a halter around every neck, as you may say. Perhaps a very little thought will, not, will now enable you to account for those repeated whaling disasters, some few of which are casually chronicled, of this man or that man being taken out of the boat by the line and lost. For when the line is darting out, to be seated then in the boat is like being seated in the midst of the manifold whizzings of a steam engine in full play, when every flying beam and shaft and wheel is grazing you. It is worse, for you cannot sit motionless in the heart of these perils, because the boat is rocking like a cradle, and you are pitched one way and the other without the slightest warning, and only by a certain self-adjusting buoyancy and simultaneous of volition and action can you escape being made a mazeppa of, and run away with where the all-seeing sun himself could never pierce you out. Again, as the profound calm which only apparently precedes and prophecies of the storm, and contains, in, and contains it in itself, as the seemingly harmless rifle holds the fatal powder and the ball and the explosion, so the graceful repose of the line, as it silently serpentines about the oarsman before being brought into actual play. This is a thing which carries more of true terror than any other aspect of this dangerous affair. But why say more? All men live enveloped in whale lines. All are born with halters round their necks. But it is only when caught in the swift, sudden turn of death that mortals realize the silent, subtle, ever-present perils of life. And if you be a philosopher, though seated in the whale boat, you would not, at heart, feel one whit more of terror than though seated before your evening fire with a poker and not a harpoon by your side. Chapter 61, Stubb Kills a Whale. If to Starbuck the apparition of the squid was a thing of portents, to Queequeg it was quite a different object. When you see him squid, said the savage, honing his harpoon in the bow of his hoisted boat, then you quick see him farm whale. The next day was exceedingly still and sultry, and with nothing special to engage them, the Pequod's crew could hardly resist the spell of sleep induced by such a vacant sea. For this part of the Indian Ocean through which we were then voyaging is not what whalemen call a lively ground. That is, it affords fewer glimpses of porpoises, dolphins, flying fish, and other vivacious denizens of more stirring waters than those off the Rio de la Plata or the inshore ground off Peru. It was my turn to stand at the foremast head and with my shoulders leaning against the slackened royal shrouds to and fro, I idly swayed in what seemed an enchanted air. No resolution could withstand it. In that dreamy mood, losing all consciousness, at last my soul went out of my body, though my body continued to sway as a pendulum will, long after the power which first moved it is withdrawn. Air forgetfulness altogether came over me. I had noticed that the seamen at the main and mizzen mastheads were already drowsy, so that at last all three of us lifelessly swung from the spars, and for every swing that we made, there was a nod from below from the slumbering helmsman. The waves too nodded their indolent crests, and across the wide trance of sea, east nodded to west, and the sun over all. Suddenly bubbles seemed bursting beneath my closed eyes. Like vices, my hands grasped the shrouds. Some invisible, gracious agency preserved me, and with a shock I came back to life. And lo, 
close under our lee, not 40 fathoms off, a gigantic, a gigantic sperm whale lay rolling in the water like the capsized hull of a frigate, his broad glossy back of an Ethiopian hue, glistening in the sun's rays like a mirror, but lazily undulating in the trough of the sea and ever and anon tranquilly spouting his vapory jet. The whale looked like a portly burger smoking his pipe of a warm afternoon. But that pipe, poor whale, was thy last. As if struck by some enchanter's wand, the sleepy ship and every sleeper in it all at once started into wakefulness. And more than a score of voices from all parts of the vessel, simultaneously with the three notes from aloft, shouted forth the accustomed cry as the great fish slowly and regularly spouted the sparkling brine into the air. Clear away the boats, luff, cried Ahab. And obeying his own order, he dashed the helm down before the helmsman could handle the spokes. The sudden exclamations of the crew must have alarmed the whale. And ere the boats were down, majestically turning, he swam away to the leeward, but with such steady tranquility and making so few ripples as he swam, that thinking after all, he might not as yet be alarmed. Ahab gave orders that not an oar should be used and no man must speak but in whispers. So seated like Ontario Indians on the gunwales of the boats, we swiftly but silently paddled along, the calm not admitting of the noiseless sails being set. Presently, as we thus glided in chase, the monster perpendicularly flitted his tail 40 feet in the air and then sank out of sight like a tower swallowed up. There go the flukes, was the cry, an announcement immediately followed by Stubbs producing his match and igniting his pipe, for now a respite was granted. After the full interval of his sounding had elapsed, the whale rose again, and being now in advance of the smoker's boat and much nearer to it than to any of the others, Stubb counted upon the honor of the capture. It was obvious now that the whale had at length become aware of his pursuers. All silence of cautiousness was therefore no longer of use. Paddles were dropped and oars came loudly into play. And still puffing at his pipe, Stubb cheered on his crew to the assault. Yes, a mighty change had come over the fish. All alive to his jeopardy, he was going head out, that part obliquely dropped, projecting from the mad yeast which he brewed. Start her, start her, my men. Don't hurry yourselves. Take plenty of time, but start her. Start her like thunderclaps, that's all, cried Stubb sputtering out the smoke as he spoke. Starter now, give him a long, strong stroke, Tashtigo. Starter, Tash, my boy, starter. All but keep cool, keep cool. Cucumbers is the word, easy, easy. Only starter like grim death and grinning devils. Raise the buried head perpendicular out of their graves, boys. That's all, starter. Woo hoo, wah he, screamed the gay header in reply raising some old war whoop to the skies as every oarsman in the strained boat involuntarily bounced forward with the one tremendous leading stroke which the eager Indian gave. It will be seen in some other place of what a very light substance the entire interior of the sperm whale's enormous head consists. Though apparently not the most massive, it is by far the most buoyant part about him so that with ease he elevates it in the air, it invariably does so when going at his utmost speed. Besides, such is the breadth of the upper part of the front of his head, and such the tapering cut water formation of the lower part, that by obliquely elevating his head, he thereby may be said to transform himself from a bluff-bowed, sluggish galliot into a sharp-pointed New York pilot boat. But his wild screams were answered by others quite as wild. Kihi, kihi, yelled Dagu, straining forward and backward on his seat like a pacing tiger in his cage. Kala, kalu, howled Queequeg, as if smacking his lips over a mouthful of grenadier steak. And thus with oars and yells, the keels cut the sea. Meanwhile, Stubb, retaining his place in the van, still encouraged his men to the onset, all the while puffing the smoke from his mouth. Like desperados, they tugged and they strained till the welcome cry was heard. Stand up, Tashtego, give it to him. The harpoon was hurled. Stern, all! 
The oarsmen backed water at the same moment something went hot and hissing along every one of their wrists. It was the magical line. An instant before, Stubb had swiftly caught two additional turns with it round the loggerhead whence, by reason of its increased rapid circlings, a hempen blue smoke now jetted up and mingled with the steady fumes from his pipe. As the line passed round and round the loggerhead, so also, just before reaching that point, it blisteringly passed through and through both of Stubb's hands, from which the hand cloths, or square, squares of quilted canvas sometimes worn at these times, had accidentally dropped. It was like holding an enemy's sharp two-edged sword by the blade, and that enemy all the time striving to wrest it out of your clutch. Wet the line, wet the line, cried Stubb to the tub oarsman, him seated by the tub, who, snatching off his hat, dashed the seawater into it. More turns were taken so that the line began holding its place. The boat now flew through the boiling water like a shark all fins. Stubb and Tashtego here changed places, stem for stern, a staggering business truly in that rocking commotion. From the vibrating line extending the entire length of the upper part of the boat, and from it now being more tight than a harp string, you would have thought the craft had two keels, one cleaving the water, the other the air as the boat churned on through both opposing elements at once. A continual cascade played at the bows, a ceaseless whirling eddy in her wake, and at the slightest motion from within, even but of a little finger, the vibrating, cracking craft canted over her spasmodic gunwale into the sea. Thus they rushed, each man with might and main clinging to his seat to prevent being tossed to the foam, and the tall form of Tashtego at the steering oar crouching almost double, in order to bring down his entire center of gravity. Whole Atlantics and Pacific seemed passed as they shot on their way, till at the length, the whale somewhat slackened his flight. Haul in, haul in, cried Stubb to the bowsman. And facing around toward the whale, all hands began pulling the boat up to him, while yet the boat was being towed on. Soon ranging up by his flank, Stubb, firmly planting his knee in the clumsy cleat, darted dart after dart into the flying fish. At the word of command, the boat alternately sterning out of the way of the whale's horrible wallow and then ranging up for another fling. The red tide now poured from all sides of the monster like brooks down a hill. His tormented body rolled not in brine but in blood, which bubbled and seethed for furlongs behind in their wake. The slanting sun, playing upon this crimson pond in the sea, sent back its reflection to, into every face so that they, they all glowed to each other like red men. And all the while, jet after jet of white smoke was agonizingly shot from the spiracle of the whale, and vehement puff after puff from the mouth of the excited headsman. As at every dart, hauling in upon his crooked lance by the line attached to it, Stubb straightened it again and again by a few rapid blows against the gunwale, then again and again sent it into the whale. Pull up, pull up, he now cried to the bowsman, as the waning whale relaxed in his wrath. Pull up, close to, and the boat ranged along the fish's flank. When reaching far over the bow, Stubb slowly churned his sharp, his long, sharp lance into the fish and kept it there. Carefully churning and churning as if cautiously seeking to feel after some gold watch that the whale might have swallowed, and which he was fearful of breaking ere he could hook it out. But that gold watch he saw was the innermost life of the fish. And now it is struck for, for starting from his trance into that unspeakable thing called his flurry, the monster horribly wallowed in his blood, overwrapped himself in impenetrable, mad, boiling spray, so that the imperiled craft, instantly dropping astern, had much ado blindly to struggle out from that frenzied twilight into the clear air of the day. And now, abating in his flurry, the whale once more rolled out into view, surging from side to side, spasmodically dilating and contracting his spout hole with sharp, cracking, agonized respirations. At last, gush after gush of clotted red gore, as if it had been the purple lees of red wine, shot into the frightened air, and falling back again ran dripping down his motionless flanks into the sea. His heart had burst. He's dead, Mr. Stubb, said Dago. Yes, both pipes smoked out. And withdrawing his own from his mouth, Stubb scattered the dead ashes over the water, and for a moment stood thoughtfully eyeing the vast corpse he had made. Woohoo! We've all warming the gay head. Lançando para o céu o velho grito de guerra, enquanto os rumadores na baleira lançada a excessiva velocidade eram voluntariamente projetados para diante a cada remada do fogoso índio que se encontrava em frente deles. 
mas os seus gritos selvagens despertavam ecos não menos selvagens. Yi, ki hi, uivava Dagu, curvando-se com todas as forças no assento, para a frente e para trás, como um tigre que vai e vem dentro da jaula. Calacalu, uivava Quiqueg, como se estivesse a mastigar entre os lábios um naco de carne, enquanto os remos, os gritos e as quilhas fendiam o mar. Entretanto, Stubb, conservando o seu posto na proa, continuava a encorajar os homens para o ataque, sem cessar de superar bafuradas de fumo. Todos remavam e se esforçavam como bandidos perseguidos, até ao momento em que se ouviu o grito inesperado. — De pé! — tastiga ou atira-lhe! — Se em forte! Os remadores searam. Nesse mesmo instante, qualquer coisa de quente e sibilante correu-lhe sobre os pulsos. Era a linha mágica. Alguns segundos depois, Stubb tinha já enrolado por duas vezes em torno do tambor, de onde, devido à crescente rapidez dos enrolamentos, se elevava agora uma fumarada azulada de cânhamo que vinha misturar-se com o fumo do cachimbo do oficial. A linha continuava, pois, a correr em redor do tambor, mas antes disso passava por um raio entre as duas mãos de Stubb, cuja luva, feita de pedacinhos de desperdício que utilizavam geralmente em semelhantes conjunturas, tinha acidentalmente caído, isto era comparável, a agarrar pela folha, a, pela folha a espada de dois gumes de um inimigo que se esforça para arrancá-la. Molhem a linha, molhem a linha, bradou se Stubb ao remador sentado perto da selha. Este, retirando o chapéu com um gesto brusco, encheu de água do mar e lançou sobre a linha. Correram-se ainda diversas voltas, de modo que a linha começou a oferecer resistência. Agora a baleia arrasava a água como um tubarão com as barbatanas de fora. Cambaleando, Stubb e Tastigo trocaram de posição, da proa para a popa, movimento verdadeiramente perigoso no meio de toda aquela confusão. A linha sibilante estendia-se todo o comprimento do escaler, tensa como a corda de um violino, dir se que a baleeira tinha duas quilhas. Uma cortando a água, outra cortando o espaço, abrindo ambas caminho nos seus respectivos elementos. Na proa, erguia-se uma cascata constante e turbilhava um remoinho incessante na esteira. Ao menor movimento no interior da baleeira, nem que fosse o de um dedo, o escaler vibrando e rangendo, adornava espasmodicamente até o mar rasar a borda, semi-submersa. Assim corríamos, os homens agarrando-se com toda a força aos bancos para não serem projetados nas vagas. No remo guia destacava-se a alta silhueta de Stastigo, curvado em dois para manter o equilíbrio. Era como se estivéssemos a atravessar o Atlântico e o Pacífico num segundo. Finalmente, começou a quebrar-se o impulso da baleia que fugia. — Carreguem-nos nos remos com força! — gritou Stab ao rumador da, va da Vante. E virando de bordo para enfrentar a baleia, os rumadores começaram a levar a baleia para junto do animal, com uma velocidade superior à de reboque, atracando-se ao dorso da baleia e o joelho firmemente cravado na joelheira. Stubb feriu furiosamente o vulto que fugia. 
obedecendo às suas ordens. O escaler recuava de vez em quando a fim de evitar o balanço horrível do monstro, para de novo se aproximar e desferir novo ataque. Em redor do bruto, espalhava-se agora uma mancha vermelha de sangue que lhe descia dos flancos como regatos na encosta de um outeiro. O corpo torturado já não oscilava no mar, mas no banho do seu próprio sangue, que, que ia deixando uma esteira fumegante na rota do escaler. O sol oblíquo, refletindo-se naquele lago de carmim, refletia-se também na face dos remadores que flamejavam como peles vermelhas. E sem cessar, jato após jato, um vapor branco se elevava pelas aberturas do animal agonizante, ao mesmo tempo que em ardentes fumaças nervosas se consumia o cachimbo do excitado oficial. E sem tréguas, também Stubb içava para bordo, pelo fio, a lança torcida e depois de se endireitar, batendo-se contra a plataforma, voltava a cravá-la na baleia. — Mais perto, mais perto! — gritou para o homem na proa, quando a baleia enfraquecida começou a ceder. — Mais perto, mais perto! A baleeira colou-se aos flancos do monstro, inclinado o mais possível para diante. Stubb embebeu a comprida lança retorcida e bem afiada no corpo do bicho e conservou-a cravada, remexendo com cuidado como se procurasse com toda a precaução algum relógio de ouro que a baleia tivesse engolido e receasse quebrá-lo. Mas esse relógio de ouro era a própria vida secreta do animal. Finalmente atingiu-a, porque saindo da sua letargia para entrar nessa coisa inexplicável a que se chama a sua flurry, o horrível monstro se revolveu no próprio sangue, cobrindo as derradeiras convulsões com uma nuvem impenetrável. De tal modo que o escaler em perigo teve de fazer marcha atrás com grande dificuldade a fim de sair dessa penumbra fantástica e regressar à luz do dia. Esgotada a sua flurry, a baleia reapareceu, sacudindo-se e dilatando e contraindo espasmodicamente as aberturas com uma espécie de destrutor convulso. Finalmente, jorros de sangue coagulado, como borra escarlate de vinho tinto, saltaram para o espaço assombrado que caíram e escorreram para o mar, deslizando os flancos imóveis. O, cura o coração do cachalote tinha rebentado. — Está morta, Sr. Stubb, anunciou Dagu. — Sim. Os dois cachimbos apagaram-se, respondeu Stab, e retirando o seu da boca, espalhou as cinzas mortas sobre as águas e depois ficou por instantes a contemplar pensativamente o enorme cadáver que acabava de fazer. Chapter 62 The Dart A word concerning an incident in the last chapter. According to the invariable usage of the fishery, the whale boat pushes off from the ship with the headsman or the whale killer as temporary steersman, and the harpooner or whale fastener pulling the foremost oar, the one known as the harpooner oar. Now it needs a strong nervous arm to strike the first iron into the fish, for often, in what is called a long dart, the heavy implement has to be flung to the distance of 20 or 30 feet. But however, prolonged and exhausting the chase, the harpooner is expected to pull his oar, meanwhile, to the utmost. Indeed, he is expected to set an example of superhuman activity to the rest. 
not only by incredible rowing, but by repeated loud and intrepid exclamations. And what it is to keep shouting at the top of one's compass while all the other muscles are strained and half started. What that is, none know but those who have tried it. For one, I cannot bawl very heartily and work recklessly at one and the same time. In this straining, bawling state then, with his back to the fish, all at once the exhausted harpooner hears the exciting cry, stand up and give it to him. He now has to drop and secure his oar, turn on his center halfway, seize his harpoon from the crotch, and, with what little strength may remain, he essays to pitch it somehow into the whale. No wonder, taking the whole fleet of whalemen in body, that out of fifty fair chances for a dart, not five are successful. No wonder that so many hapless harpooners are madly cursed and disrated. No wonder that some of them actually burst their blood vessels in the boat. No wonder that some sperm whalemen are absent four years with four barrels. No wonder that to many ship owners, whaling is but a losing concern. For it is the harpooner that makes the voyage, and if you take the breath out of his body, how can you expect to find it that there when most wanted? Again, if the dart be successful, then at the second critical incident, that is, when the whale starts to run, the boat header and harpooner likewise start to running fore and aft to the imminent jeopardy of themselves and everyone else. It is then they change places, and the headsman, the chief officer of the little craft, takes his proper station in the bows of the boat. Now, I care not who maintains the contrary, but all this is both foolish and unnecessary. The headsman should stay in the bows from the first to the last. He should both dart the harpoon and the lance, and no rowing whatever should be expected of him, except under circumstances obvious to any fisherman. I know that this would sometimes involve a slight loss of speed in the chase, but long experience in various whalemen of more than one nation has convinced me that in the vast majority of failures in the fishery, it has not by any means been so much the speed of the whale as the before described exhaustion of the harpooner that has caused them. To ensure the greatest efficiency in the dart, the harpooners of this world must start to their feet from out of idleness and not from out of toil. Chapter 63, The Crotch. Out of the trunk, the branches grow. Out of them, the twigs. So in productive subjects grow the chapters. The crotch, alluded to on a previous passage page, deserves independent mention. It is a notched stick of a peculiar form, some two feet in length, which is perpendicularly inserted into the starboard gunwale near the bow for the purpose of furnishing a rest for the wooden extremity of the harpoon, whose other naked, barbed end slopingly projects from the prow. Thereby the weapon is instantly at hand to its hurler, who snatches it up as readily from its rest as a backwoodsman swings his rifle from the wall. It is customary to have two harpoons reposing in the crotch, respectively called the first and second irons. But these two harpoons, each by its own cord, are both connected with the line, the object being this, to dart them both, if possible, one instantly after the other into the same whale, so that if in the coming drag one should draw out, the other may still retain a hold. It is a doubling of the chances, but it very often happens that, owing to the instantaneous, violent, convulsive running of the whale upon receiving that first iron, it becomes impossible for the harpooner, however lightning-like in his movements, to pitch the second iron into him. Nevertheless, as a second iron is already connected with the line, and the line is running, Hence, that weapon must, at all events, be anticipatingly tossed out of the boat, somehow and somewhere, else the most terrible jeopardy would involve all hands. Tumbled into the water, it accordingly is in such cases. The spare coils of box line, mentioned in a preceding chapter, making this feat, in most instances, prudently practicable. But this critical act is not always unattended 
with the is not always unattended with the saddest and most fatal casualties. Furthermore, you must know that when the second iron is thrown overboard, it thenceforth becomes a dangling, sharp-edged terror, skittishingly curvetting about both boat and whale, entangling the lines or cutting them and making a prodigious sensation in all directions. Nor, in general, is it possible to secure it again until the whale is fairly captured and a corpse. Consider now how it must be the case for four boats all engaging one unusually strong, active, and knowing whale, when owing to these qualities in him, as well as to the thousand concurring accidents of such audacious enterprise, eight or ten loose second irons may be simultaneously dangling about him. For, of course, each boat is supplied with several harpoons to bend onto the line should the first one be ineffectually darted without recovery. All these particulars are faithfully narrated here, as they will not fail to elucidate several most important, however intricate passages in scenes hereafter to be painted. Chapter 64, Stubbs' Supper. Stubbs' whale had been killed some distance from the ship. It was a calm, so, forming a tandem of three boats, we commenced the slow business of towing the trophy to the Pequod. And now, as we 18 men with our 36 arms and 180 thumbs and fingers, slowly toiled hour after hour upon that inert, sluggish corpse in the sea, and it seemed hardly to budge at all, Except at long intervals, good evidence was hereby furnished of the, of the enormousness of the mass we moved. For, upon the great canal of Hang Ho, or whatever they call it in China, four or five laborers on the footpath will draw a bulky freighted junk at the rate of a mile an hour. But this grand argosy we towed heavily forged along as if laden with pig lead in bulk. Darkness came on but three lights up and down in the Pequod's main rigging dimly guided our way, till drawing nearer we saw Ahab dropping one of several more lanterns over the bulwarks. Vacantly eyeing the heavy heaving whale for a moment, he issued the usual orders for securing it for the night, and then handing his lantern to a seaman, went his way into the cabin and did not come forward again until morning. Though, in overseeing the pursuit of the whale, Captain Ahab had evinced his customary activity, to call it so, yet now that the creature was dead, some vague dissatisfaction, or impatience, or despair seemed working in him, as if the sight of that dead body reminded him that Moby Dick was yet to be slain. And though a thousand other whales were brought to this ship, all that would not one jot advance his grand monomaniac object, very soon you would have thought from the sound on the Pequod's decks that all hands were preparing to cast anchor in the deep, for heavy chains are being dragged along the deck and thrust rattling out of the portholes. But by these clanking links, the vast corpse itself, not the ship, is to be moored. Tied by the head to the stern and by the tail to the bows, the whale now lies with its back black hull close to the vessels, and seen through the darkness of the night, which obscured the spars and rigging aloft, the two, ship and whale, seemed yoked together like colossal bullocks, whereof one reclines while the other remains standing. Footnote. A little item may well be related here. The strongest and most reliable hold on which the ship has upon the whale when moored alongside is by the flukes or tail. And as from its greater density, that part is relatively heavier than any other, excepting the side fins, its flexibility, even in death, causes it to sink low beneath the surface, so that with the hand you cannot get at it from the boat, in order to put the chain around it. But this difficulty is ingeniously overcome. A small strong line is prepared with a wooden float at its outer end and a weight in its middle, while the other end is secured to the ship. By adroit management, the wooden float is made to rise on the other side of the mass, so that now having girdled the whale, the chain is readily made to follow suit 
and being slipped along the body is at last locked fast around the smallest part of the tail at the point of junction with its broad flukes or lobes. End footnote. If Moody Ahab was now all quiescence, at least so far as could be known on deck, Stubb, his second mate, flushed with conquest, betrayed an unusual but still good-natured excitement. Such an unwanted bustle was he in that staid Starbuck, his official superior, quietly resigned to him for the time the sole management of affairs. One small helping cause of, of all this liveliness in Stubb was soon made strangely manifest. Stubb was a high liver. He was somewhat intemperately fond of the whale as a flavorish thing to his palate. A steak, a steak ere I sleep. You, Dagoo, overboard you go, and cut me one from his small. Here be it be known that though these wild fishermen do not, as a general thing, and according to the great military maxim, make the military make the enemy defray the current expenses of the war, at least before realizing the proceeds of the voyage, yet now and then you find some of these Nantucketeers who have a genuine relish for that particular part of the sperm whale designated by Stubb, comprising the tapering extremity of the body. About midnight, that steak was cut and cooked, and lighted by two lanterns of sperm oil. Stubb stoutly stood up to his sperm seti supper at the capstan head, as if that capstan were a sideboard. Nor was Stubb the only banqueter on the whale's flesh that night. Mingling their mumblings with his own mastications, thousands on thousands of sharks, swarming around the dead leviathan, smackingly feasted on its fatness. The few sleepers below in their bunks were often startled by the sharp slapping of the tails against the hull within a few inches of the sleepers' hearts. Peering over the side, you could just see them, as before you heard them, wallowing in the sullen black waters and turning over on their backs as they scooped out huge globular pieces of the whale of the bigness of a human head. These par this particular feat of the shark seems all but miraculous. How? At such an apparently unassailable surface, they contrived to gouge out such symmetrical mouthfuls remains a part of the universal problem of all things. The mark they thus leave on the whale may best be likened to the hollow made by a carpenter in countersinking for a screw. Though amid all the smoking horror and diabolism of a sea fight, sharks will be seen longingly gazing up to the ship's decks like hungry dogs round a table where red meat is being carved, ready to bolt down every killed man that is tossed to them. And though, while the valiant butchers over the deck table are thus cannibally carving each other's live meat with carving knives, all gilded and tasseled, the sharks also, with their jewel-hilted mouths, are quarrelsomely carving away under the table at the dead meat. And though, were you to turn the whole affair upside down, it would still be pretty much the same thing, that is to say, a shocking, sharking, sharkish business enough for all parties. And those sharks also are the invariable outriders of all slave ships crossing the Atlantic, systematically trotting alongside to be handy in case a parcel is to be carried anywhere or a dead slave to be decently buried. And though one or two other like instances might be set down, touching the set terms, places, and occasions when sharks do most socially congregate and most hilariously feast, yet is there no conceivable time or occasion when you will find them in such countless numbers and in gayer or more jovial spirits than around a dead sperm whale moored by night to a whale ship at sea. If you have never seen that sight, then suspend your decision about the propriety of devil worship and the expediency of conciliating the devil. But as yet, Stubb heeded not the mumblings of the banquet that was going on so nigh to him, no more than the sharks heeded the smacking of his own Epicurean lips. Cook, cook, where's that old fleece? He cried at length, widening his legs still further, as if to form a more secure base for his supper, and at the same time, darting his fork into the dish, as if stabbing with his lance. Cook, you cook, sail this way, cook. The old black, not in any very high glee at having been previously roused from his warm hammock at a most unseasonable hour, came shambling along his galley, for, like many old blacks, there was something the matter with his knee pants, which he did not keep well scoured like his other pants. This old fleece, as they called him, came shuffling and limping along, assisting his step with his tongs, which, after a clumsy fashion, were made of straightened iron hoops. 
This old ebony floundered along and in obedience to the word of command came to a dead stop on the opposite side of Stubb's sideboard when, with both hands folded before him and resting on his two-legged cane, he bowed his arched back still further over, at the same time sideways, inclining his head so as to bring his best ear into play. Hook, said Stubb, rapidly lifting a rather reddish morsel to his mouth. Don't you think this steak is rather overdone? You've been beating the steak too much, Cook. It's too tender. Don't I always say that to be good, a whale steak must be tough? There are those sharks now over the side. Don't you see they prefer it tough and rare? What a shindy they're kicking up. Cook, go and talk to them. Tell them they're welcome to help themselves civilly and in moderation, but they must keep quiet. Blast me if I can't hear my own voice. Away, cook, and deliver my message. Here, take this lantern, snatching one from his sideboard. Now then, go and preach to him. Sullenly taking the offered lantern, Old Fleece limped across the deck to the bulwarks. And then with one hand dropping his light low over the sea so as to get a good view of his congregation, with the other he solemnly flourished his tongs and leaning over the side in a mumbling voice began addressing the sharks while Stubb, softly crawling behind, overheard all that was said. Fellow critters, Eyes ordered here to stay that you must stop that damn noise there, you hear? Stop that damn smacking of the lip. Massa Stubbs say that you can fill your damn bellies up to the hatchings, but by God, you must stop that damn racket. Cook, here interposed Stubb, accompanying the word with a sudden slap on the shoulder. Cook, why damn your eyes. You mustn't swear that way when you're preaching. That's no way to convert sinners, Cook. Who dat? Then preach to him yourself, sullenly turning to go. No, cook. Go on. Go on. Well then. Beloved fellow critters. Right, exclaimed Stubb approvingly. Coax him to it. Try that. And Fleece continued. Though you is all sharks, and by nature very voracious. Yet I say to you, fellow critters, did that voraciousness stop that damn slapping of the tail? How you tink to hear, I suppose you keep up such a damn slapping and biting there. Cook, cried Stubb, collaring him. I won't have that swearing. Talk to him gentlemanly. Once more, the sermon proceeded. Your voraciousness, fellow critters, I, I don't blame you so much for that. That is nature and can't be helped. But to govern that wicked nature, that is the point. You as sharks, certain, but if you govern the shark in you, why then you be angel. For all angel is nothing more than the shark well governed. Now, look here, brethren. Just try once to be civil, a helping yourselves from that that whale. Don't be tearing the blubber out of your neighbor's mouth, I say. Is not one shark good, right as tutter to that whale? And by God, none on you has a right to that whale. That whale belong to someone else. I know some of you has very big mouth, bigger than others. But then the big mouth sometimes has the small bellies, so that the bigness of the mouth is not to swallow it with, but to bite off the blubber for the small fry of sharks that can't get into the scratch to help themselves. Well done, old fleece, cried Stubb. That's Christianity. Go on. No use going on. The damn willins will keep us scrouging and slapping each other, Massa Stubb. They don't hear one word. No use of preaching to such damn guttons as you call them till their bellies is full and their bellies is bottomless. 
And when they do get them full, they won't hear you then, for then they sink in the sea, go fast asleep on the coral, and can't hear nothing at all, no more, forever and ever. Upon my soul, I am about of the same opinion. So give the benediction, fleece, and I'll away to my supper. Upon this, Fleece, holding both hands over the fishy mob, raised his shrill voice and cried, Cut it, fellow critters! Kick up the damnedest row as ever you can. Fill your damn bellies till they bust, and then die. Now cook, said Stubb, resuming his supper at the capstan. Stand just where you stood before, there, over against me, and pay particular attention. All dention, said Fleece, again stooping over upon his tongs in the desired position. Well, said Stubb, helping himself freely meanwhile, I shall now go back to the subject of this steak. In the first place, how old are you, Cook? <laughs> what that got to do with take, said the old blacks testily. Silence! How old are you, Cook? About 90, they say he gloomily muttered. And have you lived in this world hard upon 100 years, cook, and do not yet, do not know yet how to cook a whale steak? Rapidly bolting another mouthful at the last word so that the morsel seemed a continuation of the question. Where were you born, cook? Hind a hatchway in a ferry boat, going over the Roanoke. Born in a ferry boat? That's queer, too. But I want to know what country you were born in, Cook. Didn't I say? The Roanoke country, he cried sharply. No, you didn't, Cook. But I'll tell you what I'm coming to, Cook. You must go home and be born over again. You don't know how to cook a whale steak yet. Press my soul if I cook another one, he growled angrily turning round to depart. Come back, cook. Here, hand me those tongs. Now, take a bit of steak there and tell me if you think that steak cooked as it should be. Take it, I say, holding the tongs toward him. Take it and taste it. Faintly smacking his withered lips over, for a, over it for a moment, the old Negro muttered, Best cook steak I ever taste. Juicy, very juicy. Cook, said Stubb, squaring himself once more. Do you belong to the church? Pass one once in Cape Town, said the old man sullenly. And you have once in your life passed a holy church in Cape Town, where you doubtless overheard a holy parson addressing his hearers as his fellow as his beloved fellow creatures, have you, Cook? And yet you come here and tell me such a dreadful lie as you did just now, eh? said Stubb. Where do you expect to go to, Cook? Go to bed. Very soon, he mumbled, half turning as he spoke. Avast! Heave to! I mean when you die, Cook. It's an awful question. Now, what's your answer? When this old black man dies, said the Negro slowly, changing his whole air and demeanor, he himself won't go nowhere, but some blessed angel will come and fetch him. Fetch him? How? In a coach and four, as they fetched Elijah? And fetch him where? Up there said Fleece, holding his tongue straight over his head and keeping it there very solemnly. So then, you expect to go up into our main top, do you, Cook, when you are dead? But don't you know the higher you climb, the colder it gets? Main top, eh? Didn't say that at all, said Fleece again in the sulks. You said up there, didn't you? And now look yourself and see where your tongues are pointing. But perhaps you expect to get into heaven 
by crawling through the lover's hole, Cook. But no, no, Cook, you don't get there except you go the regular way, round by the rigging. It's a ticklish business, but must be done or else it's no go. But none of us are in heaven yet. Drop your tongs, Cook, and hear my orders. Do you hear? Hold your hat in one hand and clap the other atop your heart when I'm giving my orders, Cook. What? That's your heart there? That's your gizzard. Aloft, aloft. That's it. Now you have it. Hold it there now and pay attention. All oh, Denshin, said the old black, with both hands placed as desired, vainly wriggling his grizzled head as if to get both ears in front at one and the same time. Well then, Cook, you see this whale steak of yours was so very bad that I have put it out of sight as soon as possible. You see that, don't you? Well, for the future, when you cook another whale steak for my private table here, the capstan, I tell you what to do so as not to spoil it by overdoing. Hold the steak in one hand and show a live coal to it with the other. That done, dish it, do you hear? And now tomorrow, Cook, when we are cutting in the fish, be sure you stand by to get the tips of his fins. Have them put in pickle. As for the ends of the flukes, have them soused, Cook. There, now you may go. But Fleece had hardly got three paces off when he was recalled. Cook, give me cutlets for supper tomorrow night in the midwatch. Do you hear? Away you sail then. Hello, a stop, make a bow before you go. Avast, heaving again. Whale balls for breakfast, don't forget. Wish, by gore, whale eat him, instead of him eat whale. I'm breast if he ain't more a shark than massa shark hisself, muttered the old man, limping away with which sage ejaculation he went to his hammock. Chapter 65 of Moby Dick, The Whale is a Dish. That mortal man should feed upon the creature that feeds his lamp, and, like Stubb, eaten by his own light, as you may say, this seems so outlandish a thing that one needs to go a little into the history and philosophy. It is upon record that three centuries ago, the tongue of the right whale was esteemed as a great delicacy in France, and commanded large prices there. Also, that in Henry VIII's time, a certain cook of the court obtained a handsome reward for inventing an admirable sauce to be eaten with barbecued porpoises, which, you remember, are a species of whale. Porpoises, indeed, are to this day considered fine eating. The meat is made into balls of about the size of billiard balls, and being well seasoned and spiced might be taken for turtle balls or veal balls. The old monks of Dunfermline were very fond of them. They had a great porpoise grant from the crown. The fact is that among his hunters, at least, the whale would by all hands be considered a noble dish, were there not so much of him. But when you come to sit before, sit down before a meat pie nearly 100 feet long, it takes away your appetite. One of the most unprejudiced, of the, only of the most unprejudiced men, like Stubb, nowadays partake of cooked whales, but the Eskimo are not so fastidious. We all know how they live upon whales and have rare old vintages of prime old training. So Granda, one of their most famous doctors, recommend strips of blubber for infants as being exceedingly juicy and nourishing. And this reminds me that certain Englishmen, who long ago accidentally left in Greenland by a whaling vessel, that these men actually lived for several months on the moldy scraps of whales which had been left ashore after trying out the blood. Among the Dutch whalesmen, these scraps are called fritters, which, indeed, they greatly resemble being brown and, brown and crisp, and something smelling like old Amsterdam's housewives' doughnuts or holy cooks when fresh. They have such an eatable look that the most self-denying stranger can hardly keep his hands off. But what further depreciates the, the whale as a civilized dish is his exceeding richness. He is like the great prize ox of the sea, too fat to be delicately good. Look at his hump, which would be as fine eating as the buffalo's, which is an esteemed as a rare dish, were it not such a solid pyramid of fat. But the spermaceti itself, how bland and creamy that is, like the transparent, half-jellied white meat of a coconut in the third month of its growth, 
yet far too rich to supply a substitute for butter. Nevertheless, many whalemen have a method of absorbing it in some other substance and then partaking it. In the long try watches of the night, it is a common thing for seamen to dip their ship biscuit into the huge oil pots and let them fry there for a while. Many a good supper have I thus made. In the case of a small sperm whale, the brains are accounted a fine dish. The casset of the skull is broken with an axe, and the two plump, whitish lobes being withdrawn, precisely resembling two large puddings. They are then mixed with four, and cooked into a most delicatable mess, in favor of some what resembling calf's head, which is quite a dish among some epicures, and everyone knows that some young bucks among the epicures, by continually dining upon calf's brains, by and by get to have a little brains of their own, so as to be able to kill a calf's head from their own heads, which indeed requires uncommon discrimination. And that is the reason why a young buck with an intelligent looking calf's head before him is somehow one of the saddest sights you can see. The great head, the, the head looks a sort of reproachfully at him, with an et tu brute expression. It is not, perhaps, entirely because the whale is so excessively unctuous that landsmen seem to regard the eating of him with abhorrence. That appears to result in some way from the consideration before mentioned, i.e., that a man should eat a newly murdered thing of the sea, and eat it too by its own light. But no doubt the first man that ever murdered an ox was regarded as a murderer. Perhaps he was hung, and if he had been put on trial by oxen, he certainly would have been, and he certainly deserved it if any murderer does. Go to the meat market of a Saturday night and see the crowds of live bipeds staring up the long roads of dead quadrupeds. Does not that sight take a tooth out of the cannibal's jaw? Cannibals? Who is not a cannibal? I tell you it will be more tolerable for the Fiji that salted down a lean missionary in a cellar against a common famine. It will be more tolerable for that provident Fiji, I say, in the day of judgment, than for thee, civilized and enlightened gourmand, who nailest geese to the ground and feasted upon their bloated livers in thy pate foie gras. But Stubb, he eats the whale by its own light, does he? And that is adding insult to injury, is it? Look at your knife handle. There, my civilized and enlightened gourmand, dining off of roast beef, what is that handle made of? What but the bones of the brother th of the ox you are eating? And what do you pick your teeth with after devouring that fat goose, with a feather of the same fowl? And with what quill did the secretary of the Society for the Suppression of Cruelty to Ganders formally indict his, his circulars? It is only within the last month or two that that society passed a resolution to patronize nothing but steel pens. Chapter 66. The Shark Massacre. When, in the southern fishery, a captured sperm whale, after a long and weary toil, is brought alongside late at night, it is not, as a general thing at least, customary to proceed at once to the business of cutting him in. For that business is an exceedingly laborious one, is not very soon completed, and requires all hands to set about it. Therefore, the common usage is to take in all sail, lash the helm a lee, and then send every one below to his hammock to daylight, with the reservation that until that time, anchor watchers shall be kept, that is, two and two for an hour each couple, the crew in rotation shall mount the deck to see that all goes well. But sometimes, especially Upon the line in the Pacific, this plan will not answer at all, because such incalculable hosts of sharks gather round the moored carcass. That were he left to sow for six hours, say, on a stretch, little more than the skeleton would be visible by morning. In most other parts of the ocean, however, where these fish do not so largely abound, their wondrous veracity can be, at times, considerably diminished. By vigorously stirring them up with sharp well and spade, a procedure notwithstanding, which in some instances only seems to tickle them into still greater activity. But it was not thus in the present case with the Pequot sharks. Though, to be sure, any man unaccustomed to such sights to have looked over her side that night would have almost thought the whole round sea was one huge cheese and those sharks, the maggots in it. Nevertheless, upon Stubb setting the anchor watch after his supper was concluded, 
and when accordingly Queequeg and the forecastle seamen came on deck, no small excitement was created among the sharks. For immediately suspending the cutting stages over the side and lowering three lanterns so that they cast long gleams of light over the turbid sea, these two mariners, darting their long wailing spade, kept up an incessant murdering of the sharks. By striking the king still deep into their skulls, seemingly their only vital part, but in the foamy confusion of their mixed and struggling hosts, the marksmen could not always hit their masks, and this brought about new revelations of the incredible ferocity of the foe. They viciously snapped, not only at each other's disembowelments, but like flexible boughs, bent round and bit thereon. Till those entrails seemed swallowed over and over again by the same elf to be appositely voided by the gap in wound. Nor was this all. It was unsafe to meddle with the corpuses and ghosts of these creatures. A sort of generic or pantheistic vitality seemed to lurk in their very joints and bones. After what might be called in the individual life had departed, killed and hoisted on deck for the sake of his skin, one of the sharks almost took poor Queequeg's hand off when he tried to shut down the dead lid of his murderous jaw. Queequeg no care what God made him, shark, said the savage, agonizingly lifting his hand up and down. Whether Fiji God or Nantucket God, but the God what made the shark must be one damn engine. Chapter 67, Cutting In. It was a Saturday night, and such a Sabbath as followed. Ex officio professors of Sabbath breaking are all whalemen. The ivory pickwad was turned into what seemed a shamble, every sailor a butcher. You would have thought we were offering up 10,000 red oxen to the sea gods. In the first place, the enormous cutting tackles, among other ponderous things, comprising a cluster of blocks, generally painted green, and which no single man can possibly lift. This vast bunch of grapes was swayed up to the main top and firmly lashed to the lower masthead, the strongest point anywhere above a ship's deck. The end of the hawser-like rope winding through these intricacies was then conducted to the windlass, and the huge lower block of the tackles was swung over the whale. To this block, the great blubber hook weighing some 100 pounds was attached, and now suspended in stages over the side, Starbuck and Stubb, the mates, armed with their long spades, began cutting a hole in the body for the insertion of the hook just above the nearest of the two side fins. This done, a broad semicircular line is cut round the hole, the hook is inserted, and the main body of the crew striking up a wild chorus now commence heaving in one dense crowd at the windlass, when instantly the entire ship careens over on her side. Every bolt in her starts like the nail heads of an old house in frosty weather. She trembles, quivers, and nods her frighted mastheads to the sky. More and more she leans over to the whale, while every gasping heave of the windlass is answered by a helping heave from the billows till at last a swift, startling snap is heard. With a great swash, the ship rolls upwards and backwards from the whale, and the triumphant tackle rises into sight, dragging after it the disengaged semicircular end of the first strip of blubber. Now, as the blubber envelops the whale precisely as the rind does an orange, so is it stripped off from the body precisely as an orange is sometimes stripped by spiralizing it. For the strain constantly kept up by the windlass continually keeps the whale rolling over and over in the water, and as the blubber in one strip uniformly peels off along the line called the scarf, 
simultaneously cut by the spades of Starbuck and Stubb, the mates, and just as fast as it is thus peeled off, and indeed, by that very act itself, it is all the time being hoisted higher and higher aloft, till its upper end grazes the main top. The men at the windlass then cease heaving, and for a moment or two, the prodigious blood-dripping mass sways to and fro as if let down from the sky, and everyone present must take good heed to dodge it when it swings, else it may box his ears and pitch him headlong overboard. One of the attending harpooners now advances with a long, keen weapon called a boarding sword, and watching his chance, he dexterously slices out a considerable hole in the lower part of the swaying mass. Into this hole, the end of the second alternating great tackle is then hooked so as to retain a hold upon the blubber in order to prepare for what follows. Whereupon this accomplished swordsman, warning all hands to stand off, once more makes a scientific dash at the mass and with a few sidelong, desperate, lunging slicings, severs it completely in twain, so that while the short lower part is still fast, the upper long strip called the blanket piece swings clear and is all ready for lowering. The heavers forward now resume their song, and while the one tackle is peeling and hoisting a second strip from the whale, the other is slowly slackened away and down goes the first strip through the main hatchway right beneath into an unfurnished parlor called the blubber room. Into this twilight apartment, sundry nimble hands keep coiling away the long blanket piece as if it were a great live mass of plated serpents. And thus the work proceeds. The two tackles hoisting and lowering simultaneously, both whale and windlass heaving, the heaver singing, the blubber room gentlemen coiling, the mates scarfing, the ship straining, and all hands swearing occasionally by way of assuaging the general friction. I have given no small attention to that not unvexed subject, the skin of the whale. I have had controversies about it with experienced whalemen afloat and learned naturalists ashore. My original opinion remains unchanged but it is only an opinion. The question is, what and where is the skin of the whale? Already you know what his blubber is. That blubber is something of the consistence of firm, close-grained beef, but tougher, more elastic and compact, and ranges from 8 or 10 to 12 and 15 inches in thickness. Now, however preposterous it may at first seem to talk of any creature's skin as being of that sort of consistence and thickness, Yet in point of fact there are no arguments against such a presumption, because you cannot raise any other dense enveloping layer from the whale's body but that same blubber, and the outermost enveloping layer of any animal, if reasonably dense, what can that be but the skin? True, from the unmarred dead body of the whale, you may scrape off with your hand an infinitely thin, transparent substance, somewhat resembling the thinnest shreds of isinglass, only it is almost as flexible and soft as satin, that is, previous to being dried, when it becomes rather hard and brittle. I have several such dried bits, which I use for marks in my whale books. It is transparent, as I said before, and being laid upon the printed page, I have sometimes pleased myself with fancying it exerted a magnifying influence. At any rate, it is pleasant to read about whales through their own spectacles, as you may say. But what I am driving at here is this. That same infinitely thin isinglass substance, which, I admit, invests the entire body of the whale, is not so much to be regarded as the skin of the creature as the skin of the skin, so to speak. For it was simply ridiculous to say that the proper skin of the tremendous whale is thinner and more tender than the skin of a newborn child. But no more of this. Assuming the blubber to be the skin of the whale, then, when this skin as in the case of a very large sperm whale, will yield the bulk of 100 barrels of oil, and, when it is considered that, in quantity or rather weight, that oil, in its expressed state, is only three-fourths and not the entire substance of the coat, some idea may hence be had of the enormousness of that animated mass. 
a mere part of whose mere integument yields such a lake of liquid as that. Reckoning ten barrels to the ton, you have ten tons for the net weight of only three quarters of the stuff of the whale's skin. In life, the visible surface of the sperm whale is not the least among the many marvels he presents. Almost invariably, it is all over obliquely crossed and recrossed with numberless straight marks in thick array, something like those in the finest Italian line engravings. But these marks do not seem to be impressed upon the isinglass substance above mentioned, but seem to be seen through it, as if they were engraved upon the body itself. Nor is this all. In some instances, to the quick, observant eye, those linear marks, as in a veritable engraving, but afford the ground for our far other delineations. These are hieroglyphical, that is, if you call those mysterious ciphers on the walls of pyramids hieroglyphics, and that is the proper word to use in the present connection. By my retentive memory of the hieroglyphics upon one sperm whale in particular, I was much struck with a plate representing the old Indian characters chiseled on the famous hieroglyphic palisades on the banks of the upper Mississippi. Like those mystic rocks, too, the mystic marked whale remains undecipherable. This allusion to the Indian rocks reminds me of another thing, Besides all the other phenomena which the exterior of the sperm whale presents, he not seldom displays the back, and more especially his flanks, effaced in great part of the regular linear appearance, by reason of numerous rude scratches, altogether of an irregular, random aspect. I should say that those New England rocks on the seacoast, which Agassiz imagines to bear the marks of violent scraping contact with vast floating icebergs, I should say that those rocks must not a little resemble the sperm whale in this particular. It also seems to me that such scratches in the whale are probably made by hostile contact with other whales, for I have most remarked them in the large, full-grown bulls of the species. A word or two more concerning this matter of the skin or blubber of the whale. It has already been said that it is stripped from him in long pieces, called blanket pieces. Like most sea terms, this one is very happy and significant. For the whale is indeed wrapped up in his blubber as a real blanket or counterpane, or, still better, an Indian poncho slipped over his head and skirting his extremity. It is by reason of this cosy blanketing of his body that the whale is enabled to keep himself comfortable in all weathers, in all seas, times, and tides. What would become of a Greenland whale, say, in those shuddering icy seas of the north, if unsupplied with his cosy surtout. True, other fish are found exceedingly brisk in this Hyperborean waters, but these, be it observed, are your cold-blooded, lungless fish, whose very bellies are refrigerators, creatures that warm themselves under the lee of an iceberg, as a traveller in winter would bask before an in-fire, whereas, like man, the whale has lungs and warm blood. Freeze his blood, and he dies. How wonderful it is then, except after, it, after explanation, that this great monster, to whom corporeal warmth is as indispensable as it is to man, how wonderful that he should be found at home, immersed to his lips for life in those arctic waters, where, when seamen fall overboard, they are sometimes found, months afterwards, perpendicularly frozen into the hearts of fields of ice, as a fly is found to be glued in amber. But more surprising it is to know, as has been proved by experiment, that the blood of a polar whale is warmer than that of a Borneo man in summer. It does seem to me that herein we see the rare virtue of a strong individual vitality, and the rare virtue of thick walls, and the rare virtue of interior spaciousness. Oh man! Admire and model thyself after the whale! Do thou, too, remain warm among ice! Do thou too live in this world without being of it? Be cool at the equator, keep thy blood fluid at the pole. Like the great dome of St. Peter's, and like the great whale, retain, O oh man, in all seasons a temperature of thine own. But how easy and hopeless to teach those fine things, of erections, how few are domed like St. Peter's, of creatures, how few vast as the whale. Haul in the chains. Let the carcass go astern. The vast tackles have now done their duty. The peeled white body of the beheaded whale 
flashes like a marble sepulchre. Though changed in hue, it has not perceptibly lost anything in bulk. It is still colossal. Slowly it floats more and more away, the water round it torn and splashed by the insatiate sharks and the air above vexed with rapacious flights of screaming fowls, whose beaks are like so many insulting poniards in the whale. The vast, white, headless phantom floats further and further from the ship, and every rod that it so floats, what seem square roods of sharks and cubic roods of fowls, augment the murderous din. For hours and hours from the almost stationary ship that hideous sight is seen. Beneath the unclouded and mild azure sky, upon the fair face of the pleasant sea, wafted by the joyous breezes, that great mass of death floats on and on, till lost in infinite perspectives. There's a most doleful and most mocking funeral, the sea vultures all in pious mourning, the air sharks all punctiliously in black or speckled. In life, but few of them would have helped the whale, I ween, if peradventure he had needed it. But upon the banquet of his funeral they most piously do pants. O oh, horrible vulturism of earth, from which not the mightiest whale is free. Nor is this the end. Desecrated as the body is, a vengeful ghost survives and hovers over it to scare. Espied by some timid man of war or blundering discovery vessel from afar, when the distance obscuring the swarming fowls nevertheless still shows the white mass floating in the sun, and the white spray heaving high against it. Straightway the whale's unharming corpse, with trembling fingers, is set down in the log. Shoals, rocks, and breakers hereabouts, beware! And for years afterwards, perhaps, ships shun the place, leaping over it as silly sheep leap over a vacuum because their leader originally leaped there when their stick was held. There's your law of precedence. There's your utility of traditions. There's the story of your obstinate survival of old beliefs, never bottomed on the earth, and not now not even hovering in the air. There's orthodoxy. Thus, while in life the great whale's body may have been a real terror to his foes, in his death, his ghost becomes a powerless panic to a world. Are you a believer in ghosts, my friend? There are other ghosts than the Cock Lane one, and far deeper men than Dr. Johnson who believe in them. Reading chapter 70, The Sphinx. It should not have been omitted that previous to completely stripping the body of the Leviathan, he was beheaded. Now, the beheading of the sperm whale is a scientific anatomical feat, upon which experienced whale surgeons very much pride themselves, and not without reason. Consider that the whale has nothing that can properly be called a neck. On the contrary, where his head and body seem to join, there, in that very place, is the thickest part of him. Remember also that the surgeon must operate from above, some eight or ten feet intervening between him and his subject, and that subject almost hidden in a discolored, rolling, and oftentimes tumultuous and bursting sea. Bear in mind, too, that under these untoward circumstances, he has to cut many feet deep in the flesh, and in that subterraneous manner, without so much as getting one single peep into the ever-contracting gash thus made, he must skillfully steer clear of all adjacent interdicted parts, and exactly divide the spine at a critical point hard by its intersection into the skull. Do you not marvel then at Stubb's boast that he demanded but 10 minutes to behead a sperm whale. When first severed, the head is dropped astern and held there by a cable until the body is stripped. That done, if it belongs to a small whale, it is, host, it is hoisted on deck to be deliberately disposed of. But with a full-grown leviathan, this is impossible. 
for the sperm whale's head embraces nearly one third of his entire bulk, and completely to suspend such a burden as that, even by the immense tackles of a whaler, this were as vain a thing as to attempt weighing a Dutch barn in jeweler's scales. The Picard's whale being decapitated and the body stripped, the head was hoisted against the ship's side, about halfway out of the sea, so that it might yet in great part be buoyed up by its natural element. And there, with the strained craft steeply leaning over it, by reason of the enormous downward drag from the lower masthead, and every yard arm on that side projecting like a crane over the waves, there, the blood-dripping head hung to the Picard's waist like the giant Holofernes from the girdle of Judith. When this last task was accomplished, it was noon, and the seamen went below to their dinner. Silence reigned over the before tumultuous but now deserted deck. An intense copper calm, like a universal yellow lotus, was more and more unfolding its noiseless, measureless leaves upon the sea. A short space elapsed, and up into this noiselessness came Ahab alone from his cabin. Taking a few turns on the quarterdeck, he paused to gaze over the side, then slowly getting into the main chains, he took Stubb's long spade, still remaining there after the whale's decapitation, and striking it into the lower part of the half-suspended mass, placed its other end crutchwise under one arm, so stood leaning over with eyes attentively fixed on this head. It was a black and hooded head, and hanging there in the midst of so intense a calm, it seemed the sphinxes in the desert. Speak, thou vast and venerable head, muttered Ahab, which, though ungarnished with a beard, yet here and there looks hoary with mosses. Speak, mighty head, and tell us the secret thing that is in thee. Of all divers, thou hast dived the deepest. That head upon which the upper sun now gleams has moved amid this world's foundations, where unrecorded names and navies rust and untold hopes and anchors rot, where in her murderous hold this frigate earth is blasted with bones of millions of the drowned, there, in that awful waterland, there was thy most familiar home. Thou hast been where bell or diver never went, has slept by many a sailor's side, where sleepless mothers would give their lives to lay them down. Thou sawest the locked lovers when leaping from their flaming ship, heart to heart they sank beneath the exulting waves, true to each other when heaven seemed false to them. Thou sawest the murdered mate when tossed by pirates from the midnight deck. For hours he fell into the deeper midnight of the insatiate maw, and his murderers still sailed on unharmed, while swift lightnings shivered the neighboring ship that, sh that would have borne a righteous husband outstretched longing arms. O oh, head, thou hast seen enough to split the planets and make an infidel of Abraham, and not one syllable is thine. Sail ho, cried a triumphant voice from the main masthead. Aye, well, now that's cheering, cried Ahab, suddenly erecting himself, while whole thunder cl clouds swept across. While whole thunder clouds swept aside from his brow. That lively cry upon this deadly calm might almost convert a better man. Where away? Three points on the starboard side, sir, and bringing down a breeze to us. Better and better, man, would now St. Paul would come along this way, and to my breezelessness bring his breeze. O nature, and O soul of man, how far beyond all utterances are your linked analogies. Not the smallest atom stirs or lives on matter, but has its cunning duplicate in mind. Esfinge. Eu já devia ter dito que o cadáver da baleia era decapitado antes de ser completamente esfolado. Ora, a decapitação da baleia é um feito cientificamente anatómico de que os cirurgiões baleeiros se sentem profundamente ufanos. A baleia, em primeiro lugar, nada tem que se possa chamar um pescoço. O local da junção da cabeça e do corpo é justamente o mais espesso de todo o animal. O cirurgião tem de operar de alto, afastado 8 ou 10 pés do campo operatório, 
que, por sua vez, se encontra quase oculto no mar apaco, movidiço e às vezes tempestuoso. E, nessas circunstâncias, pouca propícias, é necessário talhar na carne uma profundidade de diversos pés, sem poder deitar uma única olha dela ou entalhe assim produzido, o qual tende a fechar-se constantemente. É indispensável evitar todas as partes contíguas e excepcionar a coluna vertebral num ponto exato perto da sua intervenção no crânio, não é de surpreender, nestas condições, que Stubb apenas precisasse de 10 minutos para decapitar uma baleia. Uma vez destacada a cabeça, deixa-se primeiro cair para trás e mantém-se nessa posição, graças a um cabo, enquanto o resto do corpo é esfolado. Feito isto, se a cabeça pertence a uma pequena baleia, é içada para bordo, mas, tratando-se de um leviatão adulto, então a operação é impraticável porque a cabeça constitui quase um terço do volume total do animal. E suspender um tal peso, mesmo com quindastes enormes, é uma tarefa tão desesperada como tentar pesar uma granja holandesa numa balança de ourives. Depois de decapitada a baleia do picoado e despojada o corpo do seu óleo, a cabeça foi ligeiramente içada, de forma a grande parte do seu peso ser compensado pela flutuação. E ali, com o um navio adornado, em consequência da enorme tensão, a cabeça repugnante e sangrenta da baleia ficou suspensa dos flancos do pecuado quando, com a cabeça de Olofernes da cintura de Judite. Terminada esta tarefa, ao meio-dia, os marinheiros desceram para almoçar. O silêncio reinou sobre o convés onde há poucos, tão tumultuoso e agora deserto. Uma calma intensa, acobreçada com um lodão amarelo, espalhava a pouco e pouco as suas folhas de silêncio sobre o mar sem fim. Em breve intervalo e depois... Nesse silêncio, a Rab saiu sozinho da sua cabina. Deu alguns passos à popa, parando para desbruçar-se sobre a amurada e depois, passando lentamente através das cadeias, apoderou-se da enzada de Stubb, abandonada ali depois da decapatização, e enterrou-a na parte inferior da massa semi-suspensa, ficando a contemplá-la com os olhos intensamente imóveis. Assim, negra e encarapuçada, suspensa naquela calma intensa, dir-se-ia a cabeça da esfinge no deserto. Fala, pois, ó oh grande, o oh vulnerável cabeça, murmurou a Rab. Tu, que desaprovida da barba, pareces que aqui e além a canecida de espuma, fala, cabeça poderosa, revela-me o teu segredo. Tu, que mergulhas mais fundo do que qualquer mergulhador, cabeça iluminada agora pelo sol, já circulaste entre os alicerces do mundo onde se exidam esquadras e apodrecem homens anónimos, onde se desfazem muitas esperanças junto das âncoras enferrujadas, onde, na sua doca assassina, a terra se encontra lastrada com os, nossos, com os ossos de milhões de afogados. Aí, nesse reino terrível das águas, achaste o teu lar favorito. Desceste onde nenhum escafandro ou sino de mergulhador jamais desceu. Dormiste ao lado de muitas dormiste ao lado de muitos marinheiros cujas mães teriam dado a vida 
para se encontrarem no teu lugar, visto os amantes enlaçados, tal como soltaram do seu navio incendiado, coração contra coração, para as águas exultantes, fiéis a um outro, embora traídos pelo próprio céu. Viste o imediato assassinado, que os piratas lançaram do, do convés em plena noite negra para que as falsas insaciáveis das águas, enquanto os assassinos continuavam a vulgar e os vivos clarões do incêndio destruíam o navio vizinho que teria levado o bravo marinheiro para os braços daquela que se desenfinhava e esperá-lo. Esperá Ó oh, cabeça, tu que viste o bastante para fazer escalar os planetas e tornar infiel o próprio Abraão, não me dizem uma só palavra. Uma vela prandou uma voz triunfante do alto da Gávea. Sim, pois é uma agradável notícia. Exclamamos, Ahab, aprumando-se subitamente, enquanto se desempenhava as nuvens tenebrosas da sua fronte, naquele grito vivo no meio da calmaria mortal, quase que se poderia converter um homem melhor. Onde está ela? As três graus avante, por este bordo, sir. Vem para nós com a brisa, cada vez melhor, meu rapaz, meu querido, que São Paulo viesse pelo mesmo caminho e que me desse ar quando sufoco. Oh, natureza, oh, alma do homem, como vos encontrais encadeadas da mesma forma inexprimível. Não há na matéria átono. Por mais minúsculo que viva ou se egite, que não encontre no espírito a sua réplica adequada. Thank you. Chapter 71, The Jeroboam Story. Hand in hand, ship and breeze blew on, but the breeze came faster than the ship and soon the Pequod began to rock. By and by, through the glass, the stranger's boats and manned mastheads proved her a whale ship, but as she was so far to windward and shooting by, apparently making a passage to some other ground, the Pequod could not hope to reach her. So the signal was set to see what response would be made. Here be it said that like the vessels of military marines, the ships of the American whale fleet have each a private signal, all which signals being collected in a book with the names of the respective vessels attached. Every captain is provided with it. Thereby the whale commanders are enabled to recognize each other upon the ocean even at considerable distances and with no small facility. The Pequod signal was at last responded to by the stranger setting her own, which proved the ship to be the Jeroboam of Nantucket. Squaring her yards, she bore down, ranged a beam under the Pequod's lee and lowered a boat. It soon drew nigh, but as the side ladder was being rigged by Starbuck's order to accommodate the visiting captain, the stranger in question waved his hand from his boat's stern in token of that proceeding being entirely unnecessary. It turned out that the Jeroboam had had a malignant epidemic on board and that Mayhew, her captain, was fearful of infecting the Pequod's company. For though himself and boat's crew remained untainted and though his ship was half a rifle shot off and an incorruptible sea and air rolling and flowing between, yet conscientiously adhering to the timid quarantine of the land, he peremptorily refused to come into direct contact with the Pequod. But this did by no means prevent all communication. Preserving an interval of some few yards between itself and the ship, the Jeroboam's boat, by the occasional use of its oars, contrived to keep parallel to the Pequod as she heavily forged through the sea, for by this time it blew very fresh, with her main topsail aback. Though, indeed, at times, by the sudden onset of a large rolling wave, the boat would be pushed some way ahead, but, but, but would be soon skillfully brought to her proper bearings again. Subject to this and other the like interruptions now and then, a conversation was sustained between the two parties, but at intervals not without still another interruption of a very different sort. Pulling an oar in the Jeroboam's boat was a man of a singular appearance, even in that wild, wailing life where individual notabilities make up all totalities. 
He was a small, short, youngish man, sprinkled all over his face with freckles and wearing redundant yellow hair. A long skirted, cabalistically cut coat of a faded walnut tinge enveloped him, the overlapping sleeve of which were rolled up onto his wrists. A deep, settled, fanatic delirium was in his eyes. So soon as this figure had first descried, Stubb exclaimed, that's he, that's he, the long-togged scaramouche the town host company told us of. Stubb here alluded to a strange story told of the Jeroboam and a certain man among her crew, sometime previous when the Pequod spoke the town ho. According to this account and what was subsequently learned, it seemed that the scaramouche in question had gained a wonderful ascendancy over almost everybody in the Jeroboam. His story was this. He had originally nurtured among the crazy society of Neskiuna Shakers, where he had been a great prophet, in their cracked secret meetings, having several times descended from heaven by the way of a trap door, announcing the speedy opening of the seventh vial, which he carried in his vest pocket, but which, instead of containing gunpowder, was supposed to be charged with laudanum. A strange apostolic whim having seized him, he had left Neskiuna for Nantucket, where, with that cunning peculiar to craziness, he assumed a steady common sense exterior and offered himself as a green hand candidate for the Jeroboam's whaling voyage. They engaged him, but straight away upon the ships getting out of sight of land, his insanity broke out in a freshet. He announced himself as the Archangel Gabriel and commanded the captain to jump overboard. He published his manifesto whereby he set himself forth as the deliverer of the Isle of the Sea and Vicar General of all Oceanica. The unflinching earnestness with which he declared these things, the dark daring play of his sleepless excited imagination and all the preternatural terrors of real delirium united to invest this Gabriel in the minds of the majority of the ignorant crew with an atmosphere of sacredness. Moreover, they were afraid of him. As such a man, however, was not of much practical use in the ship, especially as he refused to work except when he pleased. The incredulous captain would fain have been rid of him, but apprised that individual's intention was to land him in the first convenient port, the Archangel forthwith opened all his seals and vials, devoting the ship and all hands to unconditional perdition in case this intention was carried out. So strongly did he work upon his disciples among the crew that at last in a body they went to the captain and told him if Gabriel was sent from the ship, not a man of them would remain. He was therefore forced to relinquish his plan, nor would they permit Gabriel in any way to be maltreated, say or do as he would. So that it came to pass that Gabriel had the complete freedom of the ship. The consequence of all this, that the archangel cared little or nothing for the captain and mates, and since the epidemic had broken out, he carried a higher hand than ever, declaring that the plague, as he called it, was at his sole command, nor should it be stayed, but according to his good pleasure. The sailors, mostly poor devils, cringed, and some of them fawned before him in obedience to his instructions, sometimes rendering him personal homages to a god. Such things may seem incredible, but however wondrous, they are true. Nor is the history of fanatics half so striking in respect to the measureless self-deception of the fanatic himself, as his measureless power of deceiving and bedeviling so many others. But it is time to return to the Pequod. I fear not thy epidemic man, said Ahab from the bulwarks to Captain Mayhew, who stood in the boat stern. Come on board. But now Gabriel started to his feet. Think! Think of the fevers, yellow and bilious, beware of the horrible plague. Gabriel, Gabriel, cried Captain Mayhew, thou must either. But that instant, a headlong wave shot the boat far ahead, and its seethings drowned all speech. Hast thou seen the white whale? demanded Ahab, when the boat drifted back. Think, think of thy whale boat, stoven and sunk, beware of the horrible tale. I tell thee again, Gabriel, that, but again, the boat tore ahead as if dragged by fiends. Nothing was said for some moments while a succession of riotous waves rolled by, which by one of those occasional caprices of the seas were tumbling, not heaving it. Meantime, the hoisted sperm whale's head jogged about very violently, 
and Gabriel was seen eyeing it with rather more apprehensiveness than his archangel nature seemed to warrant. When this interlude was over, Captain Mayhew began a dark story concerning Moby Dick, not, however, without frequent interruptions from Gabriel whenever his name was mentioned and the crazy sea that seemed leagued with him. It seemed that the Jeroboam had not long left home when upon speaking a whale ship, her people were reliably apprised of the existence of Moby Dick and the havoc he had made. Greedily sucking in this intelligence, Gabriel solemnly warned the captain against attacking the white whale in case the monster should be seen. In his gibbering insanity, pronouncing the white whale to be no less a being than the shaker God incarnated, the shakers receiving the Bible. But when some year or two afterwards, Moby Dick was fairly sighted from the mastheads, Macy, the chief mate, burned with ardor to encounter him. And the captain himself being not unwilling to let him have the opportunity, despite all the archangel's denunciations and forewarnings, Macy succeeded in persuading five men to man his boat. With them, he pushed off, and after much wary pulling and many perilous, unsuccessful onsets, he at last succeeded in getting one iron fast. Meantime, Gabriel, ascending to the main royal masthead, was tossing one arm in frantic gestures and hurling forth prophecies of speedy doom to the sacrilegious assailants of his divinity. Now, while Macy, the mate, was standing up in his boat's bow and with all the reckless energy of his tribe was venting his wild exclamations upon the whale and essaying to get a fair chance for his poised lance, lo, a broad white shadow rose from the sea by its quick fanning motion, temporarily taking the breath out of the bodies of the oarsmen. Next instant, the luckless mate, so full of furious life, was smitten bodily into the air and making a long arc in his descent, fell into the sea at the distance of about 50 yards. Not a chip of the boat was harmed, nor a hair of any oarsman's head, but the mate forever sank. It is well to parenthesize here that of the fatal accidents in the sperm whale fishery, this kind is perhaps almost as frequent as any. Sometimes nothing is injured but the man who is thus annihilated. Oftener, the boat's bow is knocked off or the thigh board in which the headsman stands is torn from its place and accompanies the body. But strangest of all is the circumstance that in more instances than one, when the body has been recovered, not a single mark of violence is discernible, the man being stark dead. The whole calamity with the falling form of Macy was plainly described from the ship. Raising a piercing shriek, the vile, the vile, Gabriel called off the terror-stricken crew from the further hunting of the whale. This terrible event clothed the archangel with added influence because his credulous disciples believed that he had specifically foreannounced it instead of only making a general prophecy, which anyone might have done, and so have chanced to hit one of many marks in the wide margin allowed. He became a nameless terror to the ship. Mayhew, having concluded his narration, Ahab put such questions to him that the stranger captain could not forbear inquiring whether he intended to hunt the white whale if opportunity should offer, to which Ahab answered, aye. Straight away then, Gabriel once more started to his feet, glaring upon the old man, and vehemently exclaimed with downward pointed finger, think! Think of the blasphemer, dead and down there. Beware of the blasphemer's end. Ahab stolidly turned aside, then said to Mayhew, Captain, I have just bethought me of my letter bag. There is a letter for one of thy officers, if I mistake not. Starbuck, look over the bag. Every whale ship 
takes out a goodly number of letters for various ships, whose delivery to the persons to whom they may be addressed depends upon the mere chance of encountering them in the four oceans. Thus, most letters never reach their mark, and many are only received after attaining an age of two or three years or more. Soon Starbuck returned with a letter in his hand. It was sorely tumbled, damp, and covered with a dull spotted green mold in consequence of being kept in a dark locker of the cabin. Of such a letter, death himself might well have been the postboy. Canst not read it? cried Ahab. Give it me, man. Aye, aye, it's but a dim scrawl. What's this? As he was studying it out, Starbuck took a long cutting spade pole and with his knife slightly split the end to insert the letter there and in that way hand it to the boat without its coming any closer to the ship. Meantime, Ahab, holding the letter, muttered, Mr. Har, yes, Mr. Harry, a woman's pinny hand, the man's wife, I'll wager. Aye, Mr. Harry Macy, ship Jeroboam. Why, it's Macy, and he's dead. Poor fellow, poor fellow, and from his wife, sighed Mayhew, but let me have it. Nay, keep it thyself, cried Gabriel to Ahab. Thou art soon going that way. Curses throttle thee, yelled Ahab. Captain Mayhew, stand by now to receive it. And taking the fatal missive from Starbuck's hands, he caught it in the slit of the pole and reached it over towards the boat. But as he did so, the oarsman expectantly desisted from rowing. The boat drifted a little towards the ship's stern, so that as if by magic, the letters suddenly ranged along with Gabriel's eager hand. He clutched it in an instant, seized the boat knife, and impaling the letter on it, sent it thus loaded back into the ship. It fell at Ahab's feet. Then Gabriel shrieked out to his comrades to give way with their oars, and in that manner, the mutinous boat rapidly shot away from the Pequod. As after this interlude, the seamen resumed their work upon the jacket of the whale, many strange things were hinted in reference to this wild affair. Chapter 72. The Monkey Rope. In the tumultuous business of cutting in and attending to a whale, there is much running backwards and forwards among the crew. Now hands are wanted here, and then again hands are wanted there. There is no staying in any one place, for at one and the same time everything has to be done everywhere. It is much the same with him who endeavors the description of the scene. We must now retrace our way a little. It was mentioned that upon first breaking ground in the whale's back, the blubber hook was inserted into the original hole, there cut by the spades of the mates. But how did so clumsy and weighty a mass as that same hook get fixed in that hole? It was inserted there by my particular friend, Queequeg, whose duty it was, as harpooner, to descend upon the monster's back for the special purpose referred to. But, in very many cases, circumstances require that the harpooner shall remain on the whale until the whole flensing or stripping operation is concluded. The whale, be it observed, lies almost entirely submerged, excepting the immediate parts operated upon. So down there, some ten feet below the level of the deck, the poor harpooner flounders about, half on the whale, half in the water, as the vast mass revolves like a treadmill beneath him. On the occasion in question, Queequeg figured in the Highland costume, a shirt and socks, in which to my eyes at least he appeared to uncommon advantage, and no one had a better chance to observe him, as will presently be seen. Being the savage's bozeman, that is, the person who pulled this, the bow oar in his boat, the second one from forward, it was my cheerful duty to attend upon him while taking that hard scrabble scramble upon the dead whale's back. You have seen Italian organ boys holding a dancing ape by a long cord? Just so, from the ship's steep side, did I hold Queequeg down there in the sea by what is technically called in the fishery a monkey rope, attached to a strong strip of canvas belted round his weight. It was a humorously perilous business for both of us, for before we proceed further, it must be said that the monkey rope was fast at both ends, 
fast to Queequeg's broad canvas belt, and fast to my narrow leather one, so that, for better or for worse, we too, for the time, were wedded. And should poor Queequeg sink to rise no more, then both usage and honor demanded that instead of cutting the cord, it should drag me down in his wake. So, then, an elongated Siamese ligature united us. Queequeg was my own inseparable twin brother, nor could I in any way get rid of the dangerous liabilities which the hempen bond entailed. So strongly and metaphysically did I conceive of my situation then, that while earnestly watching his motions, I seemed distinctly to perceive that my own individuality was now merged in a joint stock company of two, that my free will had received a mortal wound, and that another's mistake or misfortune might plunge innocent me into unmerited disaster and death. Therefore, I saw that here was a sort of interregnum in Providence, for its even-handed equity never could have sanctioned so gross an injustice. And yet still further pondering, while I jerked him now and then from between the whale and the ship, which would threaten to jam him, still further pondering, I say, I saw that this situation of mine was the precise situation of every mortal that breathes. Only, in most cases, he, one way or the other, has this Siamese connection with the plurality of other mortals. If your banker breaks, you snap. If your apothecary by mistake sends you a poison in your pills, you die. True, you may say that by exceeding caution, you may possibly escape these and the multitudinous other evil chances of life. But handle Queequeg's monkey rope heedfully as I would. Sometimes he jerked it so that I came very near sliding overboard. Nor could I possibly forget that, do what I could. I only had the management of one end of it. I have hinted that I would often jerk poor Queequeg from between the whale and the ship, where he would occasionally fall from the incessant rolling and swaying of both. But this was not the only jamming jeopardy he was exposed to. Unappalled by the massacre made upon them during the night, the sharks now freshly and more keenly allured by the before-pent blood, which began to flow from the carcass. The rabid creatures swarmed round it like bees in a beehive, and right in among these sharks was Queequeg, who often pushed them aside with his floundering feet. A thing altogether incredible were it not that attracted by such prey as a dead whale, the otherwise miscellaneously carnivorous shark will seldom touch a man. Nevertheless, it may well be believed that, since they have such a ravenous finger in the pie, it is deemed but wise to look sharp to them. Accordingly, besides the monkey rope, with which I now and then jerked the poor fellow from too close a vicinity, to the maw of what seemed a peculiarly ferocious shark, he was provided with still another protection. Suspended over the side in one of the stages, Tashtego and Dagu continually flourished over his head a couple of keen whale spades, wherewith they slaughtered as many sharks as they could reach. This procedure of theirs, to be sure, was very disinterested and benevolent of them. They meant Queequeg's best happiness, I admit, but in their hasty zeal to befriend him, and from the circumstance that both he and the sharks were at times half hidden by the blood-mudded water, those indiscreet spades of theirs would come nearer amputating a leg than a tail. But poor Queequeg, I suppose straining and gasping there with that great iron hook. Poor Queequeg, I suppose, only prayed to his Yajo and gave up his life into the hands of his gods. Well, well, my dear comrade and twin brother, thought I, as I drew in and then slacked off the rope to every swell of the sea, what matters it after all? Are you not the precious image of each and all of us men in this wailing world? That unsounded ocean you gasp in is life. Those sharks, your foes, those spades, your friends, and what between sharks and spades? You are in a sad pickle and peril, poor lad. But courage, there is good cheer in store for you, Queequeg. For now, as with blue lips, and bloodshot eyes, the exhausted savage at last climbs up the chains and stands all dripping and involuntarily trembling over the side. The steward advances and with a benevolent, consolatory glance hands him what? Some hot cognac? No. Hands him, ye gods, hands him a cup of tepid ginger and water. Ginger? Do I smell ginger? Suspiciously asked Stub, coming near. Yes, this must be ginger, peering into the as 
yet untasted cup. Then standing as if incredulous for a while, he calmly walked towards the astonished steward, slowly saying, Ginger, Ginger, and will you have the goodness to tell me, Mr. Doughboy, where lies the virtue of ginger? Ginger? Is ginger the sort of fuel you use, Doughboy, to kindle a fire in this shivering cannibal? Ginger? What the devil is ginger? Sea coal, firewood, lucifer matches, tinder, gunpowder. What the devil is ginger, I say, that you offer this cup to our poor Queequeg here? There is some sneaking temperance society movement about this business, he suddenly added, now approaching Starbuck, who had just come from forward. Will you look at the Kennekin, sir? Smell of it, if you please. Then watching the mate's countenance, he added, the steward, Mr. Starbuck, had the face to offer that columel and jaylap to Queequeg there, this instant off the whale. It's a steward and apothecary, sir, and may I ask whether this is a sort of bitters by which he blows back the life into a half-drowned man? I trust now, said Starbuck, it is poor stuff enough. Aye, aye, steward, cried Stubb. We'll teach you to drag a harpooner. None of your apothecary's medicine here. You want to poison us, do you? You have our insurances on our lives and want to murder us all and pocket the proceeds, do you? It was not me, cried the boy. It was on charity that brought the ginger on board and bade me never give the harpooner any spirits, but only this ginger jub, so she called it. Ginger jub, you gingerly rascal. Take that and run along with you back to the lockers and get something better. I hope I do no wrong, Mr. Starbuck. It is the captain's orders. Grog for the harpooner on a whale. Enough, replied Starbuck. Only don't hit him again. But, oh, I never hurt when I hit, except when I hit a whale or something of that sort. And this fellow's a weasel. What were you about saying, sir? Only this. Go down with him and get what thou wants thyself. When Stubb reappeared, he came with a dark flask in one hand and a sort of tea caddy in the other. The first contained strong spirits and was handed to Queequeg. The second was on Charity's gift, and that was freely given to the waves. It must be borne in mind that all this time we have a sperm whale's prodigious head hanging to the Pequod's side, but we must let it continue hanging there a while till we get a chance to attend to it. For the present, other matters press, and the best we can do for now for the head is to pray heaven the tackles may hold. Now. During the past night and forenoon, the Pequod had gradually drifted into a sea, which, by its occasional passage of yellow brit, gave unusual tokens of the vicinity of right whales, a species of the leviathan that but few supposed to be at this particular time lurking anywhere near. And though all hands commonly disdained the capture of those inferior creatures, and though the Pequod was not commissioned to cruise for them at all, and though she had passed numbers of them near the crozets without lowering a boat, yet now that a sperm whale had been brought alongside and beheaded, to the surprise of all, the announcement was made that a right whale should be captured that day if opportunity offered. Nor was this long wanting. Tall spouts were seen to leeward, and two boats, stubs and flasks, were detached in pursuit. Pulling further and further away, they at last became almost invisible to the men at the masthead. But suddenly, in the distance, they saw a great heap of tumultuous white water, and soon after, news came from aloft that one or both of the boats must be fast. An interval passed, and the boats were in plain sight, in the act of being dragged right toward the ship by the towing whale. So close did the monster come to the hull that at first it seemed as if he meant it malice, but suddenly, Going down in a maelstrom, within three rods of the planks, he wholly disappeared from view, as if diving under the keel. Cut! Cut! was the cry from the ship to the boats, which, for one instant, seemed on the point of being brought with a deadly dash against the vessel's side. But having plenty of line yet in the tubs, and the whale not sounding very rapidly, they paid out abundance of rope, 
and at the same time pulled with all their might so as to get ahead of the ship. For a few minutes, the struggle was intensely critical, for while they still slacked out the Titan line in one direction and still plied their oars in the other, the contending strain threatened to take them under. But it was only a few feet advance they sought to gain, and they stuck to it till they did gain it, when instantly a swift tremor was felt running like lightning along the keel, and the strange line, scraping beneath the ship, suddenly rose to view under her bows, snapping and quivering, and so flinging off its drippings that the drops fell like bits of broken glass on the water, while the whale beyond also rose to sight, and once more the boats were free to fly. But the fagged whale abated his speed, and, blindly altering his course, went round the stern of the ship, towing the two boats after him, so that they performed a complete circuit. Meanwhile, they hauled more and more upon their lines, till close flanking him on both sides, Stubb answered Flask with lance for lance, and thus, round and round the Pequod, the battle went, while the multitude of sharks that had before swum round the sperm whale's body rushed to the fresh blood that was spilled, thirstily drinking at every new gash, as the eager Israelites did at the new bursting fountains that poured from the smitten rock. At last, his spout grew thick, and with a frightful roll and vomit, he turned upon his back a corpse. While the two headsmen were engaged in making fast cords to his flukes, and in other ways getting the mass in readiness for towing, some conversation ensued between them. I wonder what the old man wants with this lump of foul lard, said Stubb, not without some disgust at the thought of having to do with so ignoble a leviathan. Wants with it, said Flask, coiling some spare line in the boat's bow. Did you never hear that the ship, which but once has a sperm whale's head hoisted on her starboard side, and at the same time a right whale on the larboard, did you never hear, Stubb, that the ship can never afterward capsize? Why not? I don't know, but I heard that the Gamboge ghost of, a F of Fidala saying so, and he seems to know all about ship's charms. But sometimes I think he'll charm the ship to no good at last. I don't half like that chap, Stud. Stub. Did you ever notice how the tusk of his is a sort of carved into a snake head, Stub? Sink him. I never look at him at all. But if I ever get the chance of a dark night, and he is standing hard by the bulwarks, and no one by. Look down there, Flask, pointing into the sea with a peculiar motion of both hands. Aye, will I. Flask, I take that Fidala to be the devil in disguise. Do you believe that cock and bull story about his having been stowed away on board ship? He's the devil, I say. The reason why you don't see his tail is because he tucks it up out of sight. He carries it coiled away in his pocket, I guess. Blast him. Now that I think of it, he's always wanting Oakum to stuff into the toes of his boots. He sleeps in his boots, don't he? He hasn't got any hammock, but I've seen him lay of nights in a coil of rigging. Hmm, no doubt. And it's because of his cursed tail. He coils it down, do you see, in the eye of the rigging. What's the old man have so much to do with him for? Striking up a swap or bargain, I suppose. Bargain? About what? Why, do you see? The old man is hard bent after that white whale, and the devil there is trying to come round him and get him to swap away his silver watch or his soul or something of that sort, and then he'll surrender Moby Dick. Pah, <laughs> stub. You're skylarking. How can Fidala do that? Stub and Flask kill a right whale, then have a talk over him. I don't know, Flask, but the devil is a curious chap and a wicked one, I tell you. Why they don't say is how he went to sauntering the old flagship once, switching his tail about devilish easy and gentlemanlike, and inquiring if the old governor was at home. Well, he was at home and asked the devil what he wanted. The devil switching his hoofs up and says, I want John. What for, says the old governor, what business is that of yours, says the devil, getting mad. I want to use him. Take him, says the governor, and by the Lord Flask, if the devil didn't give John the Asiatic cholera before he got through with him, I'll eat this whale in one mouthful. 
But look sharp, ain't you already there? Well then, pull ahead and let's get the whale alongside. I think I remember some such story as you were telling, said Blast, when at last the two boats were slowly advancing with their burden toward the ship. But I can't remember where. Three Spaniards? Adventures of those three bloody-minded soldados? Did you read it there, Flask? I guess you did. No, never saw such a book. Heard of it, though. But now tell me, Stubb. Do you suppose that the devil you were speaking of just now is the same you say is on board the Pequod? Am I the same man that helped kill this whale? Doesn't the devil live forever? Whoever heard that the devil was dead? Did you ever see a parson a wearing mourning for the devil? And if the devil has a latch key to get into the admiral's cabin, don't you suppose he can crawl into a porthouse? Tell me that, Mr. Flask. How old do you suppose Fadala is, Stubb? Do you see that mainmast there pointing to the ship? Well, that's the figure one. Now take all the hoops in the Pequod's hold and string them along in a row with that mast for offs. Do you see? Well, that wouldn't begin to be Fadala's age. Nor all the coopers in creation couldn't show hoops enough to make offs enough. Well, see here, Stubb. I thought you a little boasted just now that you meant to give Fadala a sea toss if you got a good chance. Now, if he's so old as all the hoops of yours come to, and if he is going to live forever, what good will it do to pitch him overboard? Tell me that. I'd give him a good ducking, anyhow. But he'd crawl back. Duck him again, and keep ducking him. Suppose he should take it into his head to duck you, though. Yes, and drown you, what then? Oh, I should like to see him try. I'd give him such a pair of black eyes that he wouldn't dare to show his face in the Admiral's cabin again for a long while, let alone down the oil up there where he lives, and hereabouts on the upper decks where he sneaks so much. Damn the devil, Flask. Do you suppose I'm afraid of the devil? Who's afraid of him except the old governor who doesn't dare catch him and put him in the double derbies as he deserves, but lets him go about kidnapping people? Aye, and sign the bond with him that all the people the devil kidnapped, he'd roast for him. Well, there's a governor. Do you suppose Fidala wants to kidnap Captain Ahab? Do I suppose it? You'll know it for a long flask, but I am going now to keep a sharp lookout on him, and if I see anything very suspicious going on, I'll just take him by the nape of his neck and say, Look here, Beelzebub, you don't do it. And if he makes any fuss, by the Lord, I'll grab into his pocket for his tail, take it up to the capstan, and give him such a wrenching and heaving that his tail will come short off at the stump, do you see? And then I rather guess when he finds himself docked in that queer fashion, he'll sneak off without the poor satisfaction of peeling his tail between his legs. And what will you do with the tail stuff? Do with it. Sell it for an ox whip when we get home. What else? Now, do you mean what you say and have been saying all along, Stubb? Oh, mean or not mean, here we are at the ship. The boats were hailed to tow the whale on the larboard side, where fluke chains and other necessaries were already prepared for securing him. Didn't I tell you so, said Flask? Yes, you'll soon see this right whale's head hoisted up opposite that Parmacetti's. In good time, Flask sang, proved true. As before, the Pequod steeply leaned over toward the sperm whale's head. Now, by the counterpoise of both heads, she regained her even keel. Though sorely strained, you may well believe. So when on one side you hoist in Locke's head, you go over that way. But now on the other side, hoist in Kant, and you come back again. But in a very poor plight, thus some minds forever keep trim and boat. Oh, ye foolish. Throw all these thunderheads overboard, and then you'll float light and right. And in disposing of the body of the right whale, when brought alongside the ship, the same preliminary proceedings commonly take place as in the case of a sperm whale, only in the latter, and since the head is cut off whole, but in the former, the lips and tongue are separated, removed, removed and hoisted on deck, with all the well-known black bone attached to what is called the crown piece. But nothing like this in the present case had been done. The carcasses of both whales had dropped astern, and the head-laden ship not a little resembled a mule carrying a pair of overburdening panniers. Meantime, Fidala was calmly eyeing the right 
whale's head, and ever and anon glancing from the deep wrinkles there to the lines in his own hand. And Ahab chanced so to stand that the Parsi occupied his shadow, while if the Parsi's shadow was there at all, it seemed only to blend with and lengthen Ahab's. As the crew toiled on, Laplandish speculations were bandied among them concerning all these passing things.